All right, thanks everybody for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, we've got a special guest today. Our guest is Brad Beasley from Beasley Mitchell and Company. Um, they work mostly out of Las Cruces, but probably across the state. Um, uh, Beasley Mitchell was, was actually my CPA when I was in Las Cruces and um, his number was sent to me by one of our members down there as somebody who was staying ahead of and understood the uh, PPP relief and uh, so he, he actually had a five minute video that we'll send out tomorrow, but I also wanted you guys to see and, and be able to ask him questions. So Brad, thank you so much for being here. And if you wanna, why don't you go ahead and do your presentation and then whatever is not answered in your presentation, we'll, we will um, ask questions afterwards if that's okay. Uh, no, absolutely. Thank you, Carol. I, I appreciate that. And thank you for the introduction. You know, it's uh, very nice to talk to all of you. Uh, when we're going to talk about this, as, as I go through this presentation, the one thing I want to put the caveat on is this is all the information, you know, as we know it, as of 3.01 p.m. Mountain Time on April 1st. Uh, everything changes so fast. When you really think in terms of, of where this legislation is, it was signed at around five o'clock on Friday, and we are here at three o'clock on Wednesday, expecting to understand and digest 500 pages of the act, plus how the SBA is gonna ultimately determine how to implement some of this stuff. And so I'm, I'm throwing the caveat out that we're trying to learn as, as fast as possible. And so there's a lot of questions that we may or may not be able to answer, but uh, we certainly are trying to get, uh, it's like, uh, like you'd said, ahead of the curve as much as possible. So uh, the big section we're going to talk about today is these uh, Paycheck Protection Program loans under Section 1102 of the, uh, the CARES Act. So now, as you can see on the screen, the CARES Act is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act, okay? And so it's uh, aptly named. Uh, the CARES Act, and we're going to talk about Section 1102. Now, like I said, this act has almost 600 pages of, of actual uh, text in it, and it's got a lot of fun references to different parts of the IRC code and are the federal CAFR in different places like that. So these loans are uh, loans that are available to any business, and Kyle talks about a business, a continuing business entity, or nonprofits. Now, when they first came out with the nonprofit section, it said nonprofit, but what it really meant was just the 501c3 groups, okay? And so this was a part that they kind of went back and said, oh, wait, we didn't really mean all nonprofits. Because uh, remember, the NFL used to be until last year a nonprofit also. And so they went back and said, no, we, we really just mean the 501c3 nonprofits. Uh, it also allows for a provision where these loans can apply to the self-employed. I will tell you that this is the most confusing uh, part of the law because we don't have a huge amount of guidance and it discusses a lot of the uh, different issues around, well, partners. I'm a partner in a partnership. I don't draw salary. I get self-employed income from a K-1. So am, am I included in wages for the partnership or am I self-employed and I should apply separately? We don't really have the answer for that sitting here today. We're trying to get some clarification and should actually later today from the banks uh, on this on this call that they're having. So, uh, in addition to that, the these loans uh, have an interest rate that is capped at four uh, percent. There's the ability that right now, because of where interest rates are, it's actually currently less than four percent. In the event that you do not qualify for the the forgiveness portion, which we'll talk about later the payment is deferred for between six and 12 months, depending on some of your circumstances. There's origination fees that the banks are gonna be charging, and those fees uh, are going to be uh, paid and reimbursed by the uh, SBA. And these are pretty hefty fees. I mean, we're talking 5%, if you have a $300,000 loan, the bank gets a 5% fee on that, that the SBA reimburses that you don't have to pay. So, um, you know, a lot of stuff there for the banks. This loan is non-recourse as long as you follow all the provisions of the loan. And as, we, as we'll show down the road that this loan also might be forgiven. 
So the easiest way that we found to understand this act is to break is these, these loans is to break them into two separate computations. So computation number one is computing the actual loan amount. Okay. So now that loan amount is based on the average monthly payroll. Okay. Times 2.5. And average monthly payroll, it's, it's interesting because in the actual act, it talks about, well, how do you compute the actual payroll? And uh, they, they say it is computed based on the wages from February 15th, 2000, uh, excuse me, from uh, one year trailing 12 months uh, from the time that you applied for the loan. So now it gets really confusing. Now I've got two or three months of 2020, I've got to reconcile plus the last part. We just got some guidance that came out from the SBA that says you can use, for purposes of computing it, the 2019 W-2 information um, that, that will help you do that. So that, that's a, a kind of a breaking piece that you'll see uh, from there. So payroll costs to compute the loan, again, is just includes salaries and wages. And it says tips, and I'll go into what it, where, where people are getting in trouble with this as well. But includes paid leave, health care payments, health care insurance, and then retirement benefits that you're paying during that time. So the tips, a lot of my uh, restaurant clients are saying, oh, that's cool, then I'll just pretend like I'm just going to give everybody a big tip. Well, no, actually tips, the only part of the tips you can include is enough to get your employees up to the federal uh, wage for the credit that you can pay. So you know that, that tips credit that you get for paying for their self-employment uh, for their payroll taxes on the tips, that's the max that you can get. So that's about nine bucks an hour, I think is what it ends up, ends up being. So um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting process there. Now, what, where the confusion is, everybody says, well, no, what about rent? And what about uh, uh, you know, all the other stuff it says? Well, that's not in how you compute the loan. Notice what else is not in how you compute, compute the loan. Payroll taxes. So you do not use your payroll taxes in, to compute the loan. The only thing you can use to compute the loan is state mandated taxes, which the only one we have in the state of New Mexico would be SUDA in this case, state unemployment tax. Okay, so that, uh, uh, that is how you compute the loan. So then once you get the loan, and uh, you get the loan proceeds, you can use these loans for certain things. Now we have a recommendation, and most everybody's recommending this, that when you get the loan, you put the proceeds from the loan into a separate bank account. I actually have a client who already has set up his account because he's anticipating he will get this loan. And so he uh, called it the XYZ company dash PPP loan, right? So it's very, very clear that that is the proceeds from the loan and what they're using for those, those proceeds. So you can use these proceeds for payroll, which is the same rules in payroll, meaning you know, health insurance um, and wages, tips, those kind of things. Health insurance payment, interest, okay? Now this includes, and rent and utilities. Rent includes anything that is on a lease agreement. Okay, so if you guys have equipment that you're leasing, in your, in your kitchens or you're leasing certain activities, you can pay that. Now, one question is, well, what if I'm leasing my liquor license? Well, we can talk about affiliates in that one if you actually own the liquor license. I think if you own the liquor license, we have an issue. I think if you don't own the liquor license and you're leasing for somebody, you probably have a legitimate lease that you could make, okay? Um, so, that's, that's an interesting part of what you can use it for. Now keep in mind the math on this thing is that one of the things that has really come up and you'll see in the loan application, which I'll show you guys in a minute, is that on these leases, the payroll section has to make up 75% the usage of the funds. Now that's not really in the act, but that's what the SBA says. I talked with one of my clients today. He goes, but that's not right. The SBA is wrong compared to the act. And I told him, welcome to being a tax accountant because they passed a law and then somebody interprets it and they don't match up and then you have to go to court. And so, you know, we're, we're used to, from tax accounting side, we're used to this issue 
of not necessarily uh, having 100% clarity. So you're going to use your loan proceeds. What I would do this on is that if you're, as you're getting this loan, then do not necessarily directly pay everything out of this loan, reimburse that account from your operating account. The reason being is that one example we've used is rent. If you're paying rent and including your rent is also your CAM, your common area maintenance, that's not rent, that is maintenance. So now you violated the rules of using those funds to pay okay, for something that is not allowed. So remember, it is just rent. You have to go with letter of the law here, rent, interest. Now utilities, they said includes electrical, gas, water, internet, telephone. It's got a weird deal that says transportation. I will tell you, we have no idea what that means. We have no idea whether that means freight. We don't know what that means whether like that's the cost to get the guy to come out and put propane in my propane tank. We're not quite sure what transportation means. So we're still learning on that. Um, so the loan can be forgiven, which is to me, this is the, the really interesting part. This can be forgiven as soon as eight weeks after you originate your loan, meaning basically you've spent down the entire proceeds. But where it's getting confusing, this is where it's really difficult for my, my uh, restaurant clients, uh, especially the ones that are not the fast food clients, is that the amount forgiven is based on your ratio of full-time equivalents during that eight week period versus your full-time equivalents uh, in, in a couple different comparable uh, periods. Now, what you're looking at is that you'll, you'll look at your FTEs, once again, during your eight week period versus the number of FTEs you had from February 1st to June 30th, 2019, or from January 1st, 2020 to February 29th, 2020. Now, our understanding though is that option is really only available if you, you weren't, you weren't uh, around as an entity meaning that you're kind of brand new into this or you're ramping up during 2019 and didn't go full time. That's one of the changes we heard this morning. That's a change with the SBA. And it talks about people employees. I hate to interrupt because you're, sure. you're on a roll, but I do want to, I do want to make sure that everybody understands that an FTE, because we really don't use those terms in the restaurant industry, but an FTE in this case is a 30 hour employee. It's not 40 hours for a full time equivalent. Is that right? Well, see, Carol, that's an interesting one because see, for us, we, we would be using 40 because the standard terminology in the IRS code and the standard terminology when you're doing cost accounting and everything that talks about full-time employees uses 40. Now, where the confusion is, is yeah, they define full-time employee under the Obamacare Act as 30, which we're very heavily involved with our restaurant clients when that came out too. So for our purposes and for our other clients, we're using 40 as full-time equivalent. Now, like I said, if that's wrong, I'd love to see it because once again, I, we only know the information that we're getting. So uh, okay. there's nothing we've looked in the act that actually says it's 40 hours or it's 30 or it references. It just talks about this full-time equivalent. Now. Okay. Well, and I, I got that from the national restaurant association. So mm -hmm. um, I will put that as one of my questions back to them. Yes. And I'd love to know the answer. Cause like I said, for us, it's, it's, we, we've been using 40, but like I said, it, it doesn't mean we're right. I'm just saying that's, that's what that is. The, the, the easy one though is like if, you know, and, and which this doesn't necessarily apply because these the restaurants I know are in a, in a whole different ball game, but a lot of our clients are, well, I'm the same now as I was before. Well, you know, we're, we're going to be pretty close on the FTEs. So it's based on the number of employees that are retained. And this is where, where, where excuse me, where people get um, confused because this is the Paycheck Protection Program. If we don't retain everybody, they're not going to refer, uh, uh, relieve and forgive and or forgive the loan. Okay. okay. Where it, this loan as it's forgiven is not income, which is different than any other loan we've ever had. Get another loan forgiven, it's income to you. This one's income. And you get to keep the deduction that they paid for. So if you look at it from a cash flow perspective, every expense that you get that qualifies for forgiveness is really about 130% benefit because you get to deduct it as well. Okay. Now, uh, like I said, we hope we have revenue or expenses or basis to deduct it if we have losses, but that's a whole different story. Um, I ran through an example in, my, in the video of basically somebody that kept all of their employees um, or an annual payroll of a million dollars or 83,000 a month. They qualified for this loan of 208,000. 
and they use their expenses here um, you know, appropriately. Now, the one piece that you'll see is they did spend $166,000 uh, on, on salaries and 208,580. You know, so they spent 20% of their revenue, or excuse me, it's 20% of their loan proceeds on non-payroll activities. Now, if really you do the math and your F, your FTE count is equal, there's no reason why you should actually expend more than the 25% because the math would tell you that you did your math wrong if you didn't get that. Now, this would not apply for the restaurant association because I know a lot of times you guys don't have the same number of FTE. So there's a whole nother ball game that we'll get into with this. So the question that we get into, you know, is here's your loan, you know, this, is, this was part of our presentation where your, your four steps, compute the loan, talk to your banker. You guys need to be heavily involved with your banker and let them know this is what you want. Uh, set up the separate bank accounts and you know, really probably have to have some help to make sure that you're not going to um, miss, uh, like I so said, the CAM is what we're seeing people get ready to miss, paying payroll taxes out of that account because you're not supposed to pay payroll taxes, uh, you know, that you're not messing up. Because if you make a mistake on this, then you have a, the risk that that loan could become recourse to you. And so then that's a whole different issue. So um, that's my quick spiel on the, on the presentation. Let me make a couple comments that go towards the restaurant uh, association and then I can get into answering whatever questions you guys have. I think that, that in the current situation of the non-fast non food restaurants, and, and, I, and I'm sorry to differentiate between the two, but I, I have both. Uh, typically, my fast food clients that we have don't uh, aren't typically down on FTEs. They're they're right at normal capacity um, and, and revenue. That's just because they're used to the fast food situation, and and people are still going through the drive-through, and they're getting most of their their activity. Uh, but for my casual dining and the non-fast food clients, you know, the revenue is down substantially. The FTE count is down compared to that previous period. Okay. And so what you need to think about is from a cash flow perspective, can I use this loan to help my cash flow? Okay, meaning uh, help me get through this next several months with paying my key people that I might have kept on staff or just enough to keep it open so that I can make deliveries and then, and then move on. The relief piece, if I'm and talking to my fast, uh, my uh, restaurant client is that the relief piece is just gravy at, at, at the top. If you can get it and you get some of it relieved, that's going to be a great situation. And then you can get the rest of it out over a 10 period at a 4% interest rate. Uh, not a fantastic situation for uh, the restaurant clients to be in, but the other side is, is that you can always, I know this sounds bad, but if you'd calculated, like in our case, in the example, a $200,000 uh, loan and then maybe you've, you've done your math and you're like well gosh i'm only going to spend like in this case where they spend 166,000, and i'm only going to spend a hundred thousand during that time there's no way to get to 166 well then maybe you take the entire two hundred and eight thousand dollar loan in this case maybe you should take 125,000 of the loan because that way you can qualify for forgiveness on the whole opposed to some pro rata piece that you're not going to take remember if you don't use loan proceeds you can just pay it back um once it's into cash flow and those kind of discussions so really difficult my heart goes out to the to the restaurant group because this really i'm not gonna lie to you it didn't really help all that much for the the, the restaurant people um because uh, like i said it, it 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 hurts and then you know, the other topic that carol you know obviously is going to mention is about the unemployment piece that we can we can talk about too so uh, Carol, like I said, I, I, I know we're just going to start getting questions and, and doing that, and I'm happy to answer whatever it is. And I certainly appreciate it. Um, so one of the questions is, do re retirement plans, um, retirement payments include 401k matches? Absolutely. It includes 401k matches. It does not include the employee deferral. That should already be in the salaries. Right. Okay. Um, what about workers' comp? It does not include workers' comp. It's not. Right. Um, there's no clear answer to this, but 
is it better to PPP fund employees or let them independently UI? <laughs> that's that's an interesting one. I, I, I uh, it is it is for the employees. Given the fact that they can get the extra six hundred bucks a week plus their unemployment, you know the employees are making out pretty good uh, for considering what they're making and the lack of, of work that they have to do. And I, I don't mean that, and I'm not trying to be facetious, but you know, from with six, you know, you're making $600 a week on top of your normal unemployment benefits, uh, pulling down $2,200 a week or uh, $2,200 a month times 12, you know, I mean, they're, they're pulling down a pretty good amount of, uh, of, of money, uh, you know, for not having to work. Um, I think for the employees, it's it, especially the, the line workers, the waiters, waitresses, and bussers, it probably is better for them to be on unemployment for them. Um, now, like I said, typically maybe your cooks and some of the other people who are not necessarily that lower tipped wage uh, people, it may be better for you to keep them on. Um, but like I said, that's, I, I will tell you, that's a, that's a hard thing. That is a hard, a hard problem. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I keep trying to, I, I keep trying to, make that work in my mind and um and i'm having a hard time so I, one thing i wanted to know so it's not about the number the amount of payroll you pay it's about the number of employees you keep so and that's that's the ratio that you're looking at so so in this example you kept all 27 employees what if you only kept 15 of those 27 you don't get the full amount is that right you don't get the full you don't get the you, you still get the loan but you don't get the full um uh relief you don't get the full uh, piece of it being relieved um because you have to keep yeah. your your full-time employees uh, as well there's two different computations that you use uh to determine what the reduction is there could be a scenario where you kept all the employees but you dropped their wages so low that you have to reduce it anyways Right. And so some of my clients were like, oh, I've kept all my employees. You know, what, what was their pay? Oh, I've cut their pay by 50 percent. Well, that then now you, you you don't get the full relief either. So there's a double catch, a double whammy. OK. Um, um, so another question is, what about car leases? Is that included? So here's the interesting one is that the way the law is written and I have the law up right here. And I'll, let me pull it up and show you guys. Because this is this is people don't. Um, uh, they, they laugh at this because if you go here and I go to rent, um, rental. so here's what it says. Hopefully you can see this. It says, what, what can you use these for, right? Section five, rent, including rent under a lease agreement. Well, I think a vehicle lease would qualify. I think leasing a, a head piece of heavy machinery would, would qualify. Um, you know, that and is is once again I talk about leasing a liquor license. That's a lease. I, I think that I think that qualifies because it also talks about interest as well. Interest on any mortgage obligation, and so people tend to stop but don't realize there's an or here. Or meant um, uh, any interest on any mortgage obligation, and so that actually means any interest. Mortgage obligation is a weird piece because it can include like your floor plan if you're a car dealer of inventory financed or whatever it is. So it's, it's an interesting piece there. Thanks for that kind of answer. <laughs> <laughs> so um, can New Mexico SUI be included in the calculation for the PPP loan verbiage? Yes, we believe it can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if the loan is more than what you've spent in eight weeks, what happens? Okay, so if the loan is a hundred, if the loan is two hundred thousand and we only spent one hundred and sixty, okay, then my understanding is that you could either a pay back the difference, and then you recompute your forgiveness based on the amount that you actually borrowed, or b the difference in that loan, it's. To, it, it's a little unclear, and I'm, I'm going to get you an answer, but my understanding is that as long as you're going to use that stuff on these types of expenses, you should be able to amortize it out. But the problem is, is that 
I don't think that's the case. I think that the difference is going to end up being um, the part that gets that gets non-recourse. So, it, and it becomes a loan at four percent, right? Well, that it, that is, it, but it becomes not a uh, a recourse loan, right? That difference. Not a not a forgiven loan. Is that what you're saying? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. But even for instance, if you spent so let's let's use the the other example. You spent two hundred thousand dollars, and you only got one hundred and fifty relieved. So now you have a fifty thousand dollar part that's not relieved. That part is a ten year loan as well, spread out over ten years at four percent, and it's non recourse, meaning nobody can ever come back and and force you to pay that loan. Okay. It's fully guaranteed by the SBA right. versus right. it becoming a recourse loan, meaning the SBA can go after you and your assets and everything else. So. Okay. Um, if, okay, that was that one. Um, Patrick had a question, anticipated versus mandated. FTEs are stated to be used from ACA. Um, Patrick, you want to unmute yourself and explain? That? Yeah, I got two questions um, mixed up, but in the PPP uh, loan application form, mm -hmm. it says uh, it is anticipated that not more than 25% of the forgiven amount may be for a non payroll cost. <clears throat> that doesn't, is anticipated mean the same as mandated? No, in, in the tax world, in the legal world, from our standpoint is it doesn't, anticipated is not the same as mandated, meaning that you've gone in and you've done your analysis and you've figured out that I anticipate that I'm not gonna spend more than 25%. That's where it's, it's, that's the difference in, once again, the interpretation on the SBA versus the law. The law doesn't really say that you can spend, once again, going back to the law, it says, what can I spend these costs on? I can, during the covered period, meaning when you have the loan, you may use the loan proceeds for any one of these activities, okay? And so um, that's one of those where you have to document your intent. Yeah, I'm anticipating that I'm not gonna spend more than 25%, okay? Because if you say for sure, yeah, all, all I'm gonna pay is rent. Well, then they're knowing that you're going in saying, I'm not gonna have any forgiveness of this loan. I'm just looking for a loan at 4% for 10 years. And they don't want that. They want it to be used for payroll. So this, this, that, actually, that part of the application, when we first saw it too, we were like, oh, they're completely wrong. You know, what are they doing? Um, but now we understand that that actually documents your intent to spend it, um, you know, on, on, on payroll activities. So I think it actually it. helps you. Got it, right. And so <clears throat> then the FTEs, when you said 30 hours versus 40 hours, uh, I had the same comment. Um, Carol came in and said, from what we heard from the NRA, it was calculated from our uh, ACA calculations. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we, I'll circulate know. that back to Carol. Yep. Yeah, we, yep. Once I get some more guidance, but that's our understanding. Like in my world, FTE is 40. That's right. That's, yeah, we, we were, well, we, that was our bone of contention with the ACA in the first place. And then uh, before we started, I did ask the question at what point? Uh, do we calculate the number of employees? Where do those FTEs, is it from the same period last year, from when the coronavirus hit? Where? What's the period of time that you use to calculate your FTEs for this form? I think for everybody, and I'm going to assume that everybody's been a continuing business uh, for you know more than a year or so, right? I think it's compared to that FTE period from February of 2019 to June 19. You look at your average FTEs during that time and compare it to the eight-week period because it, even though like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen kind yes. of little, their little thing, it, it says, oh, there's two different ways to do it or three different ways. There's really exceptions to be able to get to option two and option three. You have to really, you know, option two would be as if you're not really ramped up fully or you're a brand new business. And then the seasonal employee piece is really if you're like a, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I kind of maybe like the holiday shop or you're a ski resort or something like that to where you're like, hey, man, I didn't have anybody during See, this time. Yeah. yeah. So, so to answer that question, I was referring exactly to that document you're referring to. Mm -hmm. So it's option one from February 15th to June 30th, 19th. That's the one that we're using for everybody. That's the one we feel is, is that is the, the safest and the correct way to, to, to use that one. Now, Thank you. 
And I, but I think it's also different. I think it depends on everybody's different situation. People will try to argue that, well, a restaurant, we're seasonal, we're super busy during Christmas and we're not busy, you know, right now in January, you know, when we start in January. Well, you know, I think seasonality when they talk about it is more like I'm in a ski resort or I'm, you know, really, I just, I open up only for Christmas or I'm the ha Halloween spirit store and I'm just open for, for October. Right. So in an effort to not get this kicked back and, and have that argument, it's probably best to use option one from that document. Correct. And Patrick, I, I appreciate you bringing that up because it's another concept here is, uh, you know, our firm has a slogan and we should put it on our website, but, you know, in any tax, anything we're doing, you know, we go with the pigs get fed and hogs get slaughtered uh, rule. Okay. And we have no problem being, being piggish and following the rule, but like, so when you get a hog, that's when you get in trouble. But, you know, we've looked at it and go, man, you know, we could just be a little conservative. And instead of the loan being $300,000, we could go where I'm glad and it's 260. Now we didn't have the 300 to begin with. So going from 300 to 60, it's not really a loss of 40. It's really kind of giving me some cushion, but staying conservative. And then, like I said, you draw the whole 260. If this is what you're available to do, really look at what your unique business circumstances tends to be and don't make, don't let the, the, the tail wag the dog kind of, kind of deal. That's great advice. Um, I have a question here and this keeps coming up to me too. It's how do you count part-time employees? Okay. That's a great question. Yeah. So you, in, in the way, and we're going to go with the 40 hours cause that's what we've always used is that if you had two, if you have part-time employees, you take their hours on a per week basis. So they might work 20 hours. You might, if you have two people that work 20 hours a week, that's one FTE. Okay. And so okay. if you had, you, you just build everybody into that that yep. 30 hours or 40 hours. Now, I do want to say for the people on the phone, uh, on the call right now, we will have somebody from the National Restaurant Association on Monday that hopefully can answer these call, these, uh, these specific questions to our industry. So I'm, uh, I may wait and, and make you guys wait about uh, this FTE thing. Um, if I get the answer before then, I will let you know. But if I don't get the answer before then, Monday, um, we will have someone on the call that should be able to answer that for us <clears throat> and and reference where they're seeing that. So, and Brad, I'll let you know how that how that comes out as well. So, I, and, and the reason why I kind of go with that is that like if you take it in my business, right? So I have 70 employees and they all work 40 hours a week. Some work more, but we call it 70 at 40 hours a week. If I went 70 and here's my calculator. Yes, I have a calculator at home. I'm a total nurse, right? 70 times 40 hours a week, that is 2,800 hours in a week. And if I use the 30, then it would come back and says that I have 93 FTEs. I don't have 93 people. I got 70 people, right? And so that's, you know, that's where we would go. That's why we'd like the 40 because that. Oh, that's true. So it's, it's a more advantageous calculation at 40 than it is at 30. Absolutely. Got it because you're not going to get all of those people coming back. So, mm -hmm. so I now would get rid of overtime hours. So if people work 55 hours one week, nope, stop it at 40. Got it. Okay. So hopefully everybody understands that and we may just go with Brad's calculation on that. Um, but the ratio is based on the amount of payroll. So it's both it's FTEs and payroll. Okay, so it's both. Mm -hmm. yeah. do, so they have be, do they have to be the same employees or simply the same number of employees? Same number. Okay. And the, and the payroll number that's 25% less or up to 75% to 100%, say, is calculated from what period of time? Is that the February uh, 15th of 19 to June 30th of 19? Is that where you get that number? No, the 75% of payroll is from when, the eight week period from when you start the loan. Well, but, but he's looking back and saying, so what number of employees do I have to have in order to pay out 100% of this loan? You know? Correct, thank you, Carol, exactly. Right. So if I understand, so you have, you, if you go compute that you have 30 employees during that 2019 period, 
30 FTEs. Then you need to have during the eight week period when you get the loan, 30 FTEs mm -hmm. and, and wages that are, that are substantially similar to that same amount. That same amount calculated from February 15th, 19th to June 30th, 19? Uh, on their wages, yeah. So you don't include some of the benefits and stuff like that, but just the wages piece. So Brad, here's one that I, we've had some mixed, mixed um, information on, and I want I want to know your opinion, and and I want everybody to know that these are opinions right now. Like you said at the beginning, you know, um, this law came out um, on Friday. We're trying to interpret it today but there will probably be regulations that come out by the 15th of the month that may that may make this different but are we able to apply for an eidl loan um and a ppp loan or if not which one should we apply for first etc yeah i mean that's that's a great question i mean i think um uh i i don't I don't have a concrete answer. I can say you definitely do this or you definitely do that on, on one or the other. My understanding, because when you look at the, uh, if you look at the application on the PPP, which I have here scrolled up, um, is it asks you, it says, has the business received an SBA economic injury disaster loan? If yes, provide details as a separate addendum. So that tells me that they're going to do something to you, <laughs> right? I, I don't know what they're going to do, but they wouldn't ask the question if they were like, hey, yeah, we're not, we don't care. We just really, we want more paperwork. I'm, I shouldn't say that. It is a government entity, right? So, uh, <laughs> okay. But, so, so there is something there. And the EIDL, for those of you who don't know, is that economic injury disaster loan. Now I know that if you went and got the ten thousand, if they gave you the automatic ten thousand when you applied for that, and you got your PPP, that ten thousand would it switches over to a PPP loan. Hey Carol, Brad, this is Jean Flying Star. Um, I've read extensively on this because we have applied mm -hmm. for the disaster loan. You can receive both loans, but the funds must be used for different purposes. Okay. That's my understanding, and I read that twice in two different sources. Okay. Um, so now, um, my, my question back to you is on that one is that the, the issue I've seen with those, those uh, uh, EIDL loans is that there seems to be some requirements in there that you can't make distributions, you can't pay owners more than a certain amount. Is, is that something that you've seen in those loans? I haven't seen anybody bring me one of those loan documents yet. There are more caveats about what you can and cannot use it for. Um, also, uh, yeah, I've, I've read that. But I mean, if you have a capital need, I was in the middle of a project and I won't be able to finish it. So I could use those funds for that. But it's still a forgivable loan. I mean, not forgivable, but it's, you can, if there's no prepayment penalty, if you don't use all the funds, um, it's just a matter, you can still use it for operating expenses, but not if you've already used the other PPP loan for the same expenses. And payroll's possible, but only if you've not, been forgiven so there you go so it might make sense in that theory maybe the eidl loan might make sense for the restaurants because you also can get the relief on some of the payroll taxes that you have to pay too maybe yes. that's a better combo than doing the ppp mm -hmm. uh, yeah. i haven't written that yeah in my case i had a, a, a like i said a construction project and that is perfect uh for that uh, which the PPP loan would not have been useful for. Right. So, and it's a little bit lower interest, right? Just a bit. Right. So, all right. Thank you. Very good. Thank, thank you. you. So, so we learn from each other and thank you so much for those of you who are knowledgeable about, about this and willing to share that information. Um, a question here, have they made a determination on how they will treat businesses that applied for the EIDL, EIDL before the CARES? Say, still, say I, again, Carol, I, I missed that. Um, so this is kind of the same question. Have they made a determination on how they will treat b businesses that have applied for the EIDL before the CARES Act was passed? I was told by my banker that we are not eligible to apply for the CARES Act because we have already submitted our EIDL 
application. Um, yeah, like I said, that may be the case. I, I, I wish I had an answer. Okay. And, and again, uh, Monday, may we, we may have uh, more of an answer to these questions. That's the one that we were told early on that you couldn't apply for both. But we also heard that if you had applied for the EIDL, um, you could refuse that and have it become a PPP loan or something like that. So I'm, we are trying to get de uh, a determination on that. And maybe you do both. Maybe you apply for EIDL and PPP, and then once you get approved on both, you figure out, okay, which one do I really want to do? That right. Be, I don't know. Well, and that has been some of my advice to folks, is I just, I just want New Mexico restaurants to get these loans. Mm -hmm. So I want you out there doing what you can to get the loans. We'll figure it out later on what you can use them for and what, what, um, we need to do to get people back into your restaurants, et cetera. So um, George says the sheet that I saw said interest was 5%. Why not just borrow the maximum for now and then pay it back what we do not use after three months or whenever things become more clear. So that's kind of what you said, Brad, is that, mm -hmm. is that that amount in the end, you can just turn into a regular loan at, at, four and a half or whatever percentage it is. Um, and, or you pay it back and you don't owe the, you don't owe the money. Right. And that goes into the whole, like, do you want to spend your reserves or would you rather borrow the money, spend their money, their reserves until you figure out what the long-term ramifications are? You know, my, my concern is that if you spend your own reserves and don't do the loan, and then we say, Hey, we're just kidding. It's not April. It's really May. No, it's really July. No, it's really September. Now, you know, we're all toast, right? You know, right, we, right, 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 right. Yeah, no, that's, that's what's bugging me too. So mm -hmm. another question, does the PPP cover the sick leave that we have to pay by law? I have an answer if you don't. <laughs> so that, I, I'd love to know the answer because my understanding is there's all those other provisions in the first coronavirus bill that was passed the week before that, um, which has got provisions that covers credits on payroll taxes for that. But I know there's an interplay with the two that you can't necessarily use both, but I'd love to know your answer, Carol. So I'm going to plug, I'm going to plug tomorrow as well. So tomorrow we have a, a different uh, CPA coming on, another Brad from a CPA firm here in Albuquerque. And they are going to, he is going to be talking specifically about the sick leave law and what we need to know about that and how, uh, we need to post that and how we need to treat employees that uh, claim that. So, so I'm going to make a, another uh, plug here. Please be on the phone call tomorrow at three and we will cover that. But from what I understand, um, the sick leave is paid in a different bucket. So the sick leave is paid on a quarterly payroll tax uh, and it's not a credit, it's more than a credit, you will get payment back for the full sick leave that's taken, but that does not have to do with uh, the PPP. That, and that's what I believe we'll know more tomorrow. Um, I have a question about the number of jobs question on the PPP application. Can I ask it verbally? Um, yes, so this is from Michael Calhoun. Michael, if you will ask your, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. And sure. thank, you. thank you, Carol. Uh, so looking at that number of jobs field, uh, I think we should all interpret that as the 40 hour FTE number, not a physical number or a, a specific number of physical people that we have employed on our, on our payroll. Is that correct? Yes, I think you're hundred percent correct because I, I think the form's wrong. I think the form shouldn't have said jobs. It should have said FTE. Sure. Then the question I have uh, for our situation up here at Red River Brewing Company, we're an incredibly seasonal operation where our FTE count goes from 20 during the off season in, in April, like we are now, up to 95 in summer season and winter season, right? So uh, should I calculate that FTE number as the average monthly FTEs over a 12 month period of time? Or should I calculate that as the average number of FTEs for the 
same eight eight week period of time last year because that's really what I'm going to be compared to. Uh, I'm looking at my notes here to to look at that. Um, <clears throat> so there's that calculation. I, I think I, I don't know. I'd have to look at look that up. I think you're a seasonal when you're that different between the two. I think you're seasonal, and I think you probably end up comparing it to, to the to the same period last year. Right. That's as close as we get to apples and apples, right? And as long as I have a a defensible reason for why I took that approach, uh, if if anybody ever comes around to ask the question, I've got a response that kind of makes sense, right? And I think that's a fair statement. Absolutely, Michael. One hundred percent. That's the that's the pigs and hogs, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Ruby, thanks. Um, so we've got another one. Um, what are the dates for calculating FTEs again? So calculating the dates for FTEs deal with February. Um, let me get that right here for you. Just so I make sure the right dates. <laughs> another notebook too. February 10th. February 15th, 2019 through June 30th, 2019, right? So you'll compute your FTEs during that time, and then you'll compare them to the FTEs that you have during the eight-week period of the loan. Okay, and I'm gonna get- Brad, Carol, this is Tom. Yeah. Hey, Brad, uh, what we discussed this morning uh, was a third option. You can complete the 12, you can compute the 12 months of 2019 as well. The way the way the we discussed or we looked at it was most organizations will use the 12 month period. The, the February through June time frame is used for seasonal computations, and January February this year is used for new business calculations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we talked about, Tom. That's where the, there's confusion in the in in that piece, and I believe it's on the second. Talks about it here on the second or the one of the pieces of. Yeah. It's in the application. It's, it's in the application. It's on like page three of the application. It explains. Yeah. It says uh, for purposes, and I showed it right now on the screen, Tom. Thank you very much for showing me, for, for bringing that up, because this is not part of the law, right? So it says for calculating average monthly payroll, most applicants will use the average monthly payroll for 2019, excluding costs over 100000 So that would be your W 2, right? Your W 2s that you have. That's easy. For seasonal business, they may elect to instead use average monthly payroll for that time, excluding costs. For new businesses, they can use January 1st of 2020 to January 29th, 2020 as well. So, you know, going back to Michael's situation, you can use the seasonal piece. And I think, I think you're still right, Michael, in doing it apples to apples. But... It, it, they also say at the election of the applicant. So they're really giving you a lot of leeway here to figure out which one's the best for you. So a question, what is the math formula used to calculate the speculated amount? And that's the uh, 2.5 times your average monthly payroll, right? So it's a 2.5 times your monthly payroll. And then what you do is kind of a cash flow analysis and say, all right, in the next eight weeks, what expenses am I going to have? And, you know, are you going to have enough payroll? Um, uh, to take that, all that money. But even if you use the 2.5 and you have money left over, again, you can give that money back or use it as a, a unforgivable loan. Unforgiven. Yes. Okay. Um, part-time employees are counted in the ratio. I think we already went over that. So if you only hire back 50% of the FTEs, then you're only eligible for half of that money, half of the 2.5 to be forgiven. To be forgiven. You can get the loan for the whole amount. Yeah, you're eligible for the whole amount, but you're only it, only fifty percent of that is going to be forgiven by the um, generally, right? I mean, we're just we're using general. Okay, I think we did that when calculating. 
So when calculating the loan amount, do you include the reported tips? Because the, I mean, on our W-2s, we include the reported tips. I think because the, I think what the actual piece says that we looked at, it only includes the tips that you pay the social security tax on. Well, that's, I mean, that's all the reported tips. We pay social security on everything. Well, see, but not everybody does. Everybody brings it up to maybe the one level and then whatever's excess just, just shows up, right? So tip that's compliance. Not, well, so that's it's what you would get the tips credit for is the answer. It's whatever you get the tips credit for. Because if you really think of it, the tip wasn't your money you were expending in. Right? The tip is the customer. So if oh, you pay it. payroll taxes, it's what would you use on that 8876 uh, tips credit form? So my opinion. So we have somebody who's raised his hand and has been, his, his hand has been raised for a long time. And um, Joe Garcia, you wanna, I'm, I'm unmuting you so you can speak. What was your question? Joe? Can you hear me, Carol? Yeah, sorry, I, I think I was unmuting you when you were unmuting yourself. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, uh, hi, this is Joe with Wex. So most of my question, I think uh, from the people that I've talked to around the industry is kind of centers around um, forgiveness. So let's say for example, um, round numbers, um, two and a half times your payroll would be is a million dollars. And you, um, can you work, obviously if you come right back up to the, to the same amount of full-time employees you have, then you're eligible for 100% of forgiveness. But do you work backwards on the additional 25%? So let's say you spend $600,000 on payroll of that million, then the 25% above that, I guess, is what is available to use on other things. Uh, utilities, things of that nature. Is, is that correct? No, I think it's a 25% on the million. Okay. So it's 25% of a million, but, but what that, if you, if you do bring those employees back, I guess, so it's, it doesn't, it's just of the loan amount as opposed to of, because it doesn't make sense if you spend, if you only spend $500,000 of that on payroll that you, that you've got, and it's 25% of forgiven amount that can be forgiven is it still of the loan amount as opposed to to what you spent because if i only spend seven hundred fifty thousand, um but the the if i spend 250 on on let's say utilities just to say just for one thing then that is actually ends up being 33 percent of of what i borrowed if i if i give the if i don't it's, if it's not forgiven, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, so the forgiveness is on the eligible cost piece. So if you had the 600,000 of payroll plus another $150,000 of expenses, so now you're on 750 is your eligible costs that you would right. have. And then the forgiveness is computed based on eligible costs. So that's why like, like if you try to drive down the loan, then you keep your eligible costs within a right reason, okay? And so that's, right. that's, that's where, Right. That's what I'm saying. So it's not the loan amount, it's the eligible cost. So, so you, it's kind of like working backwards. So if I yeah. spend $500,000 on, on, on payroll, then I have the 25% above that to, to be forgiven, um, to be spent on, on other costs. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, and then another question I have as far as, and I'm, this is also on um, forgiveness as well. Um, as long as it's spent in between in that eight week time frame, because let's say I want to the people that I that I either had to cut their salary or 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 had to temporarily lay off, bring them to make them whole, essentially. Um, I don't have to work backwards on on that eight weeks if I had to go dip two weeks into into before I got the loan, do I? Does that make sense? So basically, I think you're saying if I bring everybody back and I get right. the loan on Monday right. and I got two weeks where they weren't working, I wanted to make them whole. So I paid a big chunk on Monday to all the employees. Right. But that really isn't for payroll during that period. Does that count? That's a great question. I, I think the answer is yes. I think that counts. But I, I, that's, 
I don't know the, the I can't give you a hundred percent. Yes, that's right. I seriously, we, we have studied this backwards and forwards at nauseum, I think, and look at 20 different resources from the treasury to, to the SBA to, to everything um, under the sun. And so, like I said, there's without a hundred percent directives, even with, with our banker, um, do you, do we know when there's going to be some specific guidelines that are going to, going to come out? I know obviously you can apply for the PPP starting on Friday, but I think there's even, even our bank and we, we bank with a big, big bank. Um, they still don't have a whole lot of guidelines. And, and as far as um, I got the guidelines from, from the treasury for the lenders and for the, and for the borrowers. And it kind of, I mean, it kind of stipulates that it's going to be, the government's rolling it out and it's going to be up to the lending institution to kind of, to, to kind of enforce because they'll have to apply for the forgiveness that, that they're, that they're giving. So I was wondering who's going to be sending out those guidelines for, for, for what we can use. Cause there's a whole bunch of different scenarios depending on the, on the employee, as far as if they can be considered for, forgivable or not. Right. And, and I honestly think it's going to come out from the SBA in the next week and a half. We're going to have, as we apply for stuff on Friday, there's going to be this processing period for the banks and the SBA is going to roll out a lot of these loans, I believe, uh, a lot of the requirements, excuse me, uh, and the banks are going to know, because the banks want to know too, because the banks don't want a recourse loan on their books at 4% for 10 years. What the banks right. want is, hey, I want the, the non-recourse, 4%, fully guaranteed by the SBA. That's what they want. You know. So... Um, the other thing th that I know is going on is the National Restaurant Association has sent a letter to the SBA and said, here's the things that we need clarified. Joe, I can't tell you if your question is one of those things. I don't think it was. Um, but, you know, we're asking for that clarification because it's not clear. And they actually don't have to promulgate those rules until the 15th, um, well, excuse me, 15 days from when it's signed. Correct. So, so you can, they are trying to move and fast track this, but um, I think there's a lot more that they, they don't know. Um, and some of it may come later, but again, get in line and some of this will become clear before you get the loan anyway. One other quick question as far as it relates to, to your employees and them filing for unemployment, obviously, is that going to negatively, infect, um, negatively affect these determinations if you have a number of employees who went on unemployment and then when you offer them for them to come back, is it is it there? And obviously, they're going to be making some of some of our wage employees are going to be making more on unemployment than they than they would by coming back. But does it negatively affect us if they do take these unemployment benefits or when I talk about making them whole again, is it just the amount difference in between between their unemployment benefits and let's say their regular salary? Let's say if a, a general manager or a manager, um, if there's a discrepancy. Do, do we know or do we have any any idea on that? No, my, understand, my understanding is, it, and I'll go back and look uh, and in a, because I believe there was some guidance that came out from uh, Bill McCamley, the director of Secretary of Department of Workforce Solutions, that they were going to suspend the computation of the the uh, uh, hitting you guys with the penalty on on, on the, the trust fund uh, during that during this time because it's just it's it's all over the place for everybody and I don't think that extra six hundred bucks is going to hit the state computation of unemployment. Um, I think what we're going to see is it's all going to roll out and it, we're not going to see a full effect of your answer, Joe. I think for two years because we're seeing when the, when the federal unemployment stuff comes back out in, in SUDA and whether they hit our rates or not. Because you have to remember also for FUDA, we're paying 0.9% on federal unemployment tax, but that's actually has a credit of like four four and a half 4 and percent inside of it that because the state is up to date, you don't have to pay that. But I, I think in, in a couple of years, we're gonna see our state unemployment rate skyrocket for everybody and our federal unemployment rate skyrocket for everybody because you gotta pay for it somehow. That's so they have, yeah, they have agreed to mutualize that across all accounts. So it's not mm -hmm. going to hit your account. But I think your question was, if you bring somebody back, so here's, here's the dilemma. And I had this conversation with the Secretary of Workforce Solutions 
today. And the dilemma is you've got people out there making way more than they're going to make if you bring them back. So I've got a federal law that's, that's trying to incentivize me to bring those employees back. But that same federal law just took that incentive away from my employees. So how am I going to bring them back? Well, so there used to be a part of the, the unemployment law that said if you offer somebody work, they have to take it, right? And especially if you're bringing them back to work. Um, my conversation with the secretary this morning, and I'm not sure if he was right about this, he said because we have waived their uh, necessity to look for work, that that would not be true. So they don't have to take the job you give them, and it doesn't really make sense for them to take the job you give them in this time. Now they're going to be doing the same thing. They're going to be sitting on the couch for the most part. You're not going to be able to give them work because you can't, you can't have that many people in your building, but they're going to be better off sitting on their couch with the unemployment money than they are your money. Now we're trying to work with the secretary to take that back so that we can incentivize them to come back to work and put their payroll on our payroll rather than on the government's payroll. Because yes, you're right, Brad, that it won't be very long before we go through our $500 million um, bucket of unemployment money. And then we're right back to having to build, build that up and, and really hurting businesses. One of the things I'm trying to get a lawyer to come on um, and he'll be talking to us about bankruptcy. And I'm not suggesting that anybody should um, file for bankruptcy just yet, but it may be that we're better off filing for bankruptcy than we are paying into that unemployment fund at a rate that's, that's exorbitant. Um, so that's something else and, and we'll probably have him on next week. Um, again, I don't want anybody filing for bankruptcy if you don't need to, but if you need to, I want you to have some good information on this. And, you know, we've got lots of other questions. I think some people's questions have been answered. If you don't think your question has been answered and you would like an answer, you can email me at executive at nmrestaurants.org. And, um, and then I just want to thank Brad. Brad, I know you're terribly busy right now. You've got so much going on. Um, and I would also like to plug Beasley Mitchell and Company. They're a great CPA company. If you don't have a CPA, I would say, you know, this company, and they don't pay us to do this. I didn't pay him to do this. He didn't pay me to do this, but I, I really appreciate your time, Brad. And I really appreciate you giving all of this advice to our members um, and folks. Uh, so if you have questions, email me. I will see if I can't get back to you with answers. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm pretty crazy busy right now, but we'll do what we can. Brad, do you have any parting thoughts? So the only parting thought I have was on the, the discussion about unemployment is watch those determination letters that come from the Department of Workforce Solutions. There's a client of mine who actually got one on an employee who was still working for him. The employee <laughs> went and filed for unemployment and they were still working. So like when you're getting those, like Joey said, oh, we've got to bring these people back. When it says, hey, this person filed, no, they still work for me. You can't do that. But they did it. And so they're giving them the money because there's no process. And so just watch those determinations. But, you know, Carol, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. If you have any questions, please, it's a very fluid situation. Uh, trying to get more updates as possible. And like I said, just thank you guys so much for the opportunity. And, you know, best of luck. And like I said, you know, we... We just try to encourage all your people, just like we do at our office. We're trying to order food from all of our uh, uh, sit-down restaurants in the, in the city just to kind of help them out and, and, and order for it for our staff. So just I'd lean on those people, too, if you guys can, man. Just, just do it. They need it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate everybody being on. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Same time, same bat channel.